According to Wikipedia, terrorism, in its broadest sense, is the use of intentional violence and fear to achieve political or ideological aims. The term is used in this regard primarily to refer to intentional violence during peacetime or in the context of war against noncombatants. There are various different definitions of terrorism with no universal agreement about them. Uh, however, the main part of this to look at is the intentional use of fear or terror. Now, this takes us to the alleged standoff at Eagle Pass. Uh, according to Wikipedia again, on January 11th, 2024, the Texas National Guard took control of Shelley Park, a 47-acre area of parkland in the town of Eagle Pass. Um, along the Rio Grande River, which separates the United States from Mexico, after Texas Governor Greg Abbott signed an emergency declaration to close the park. In his declaration, Abbott cited the Mexico-United States border crisis and the need to secure the border. Now, <clears throat> there's a lot of false information coming out about this. There are people who are sharing videos of desert areas, maybe somewhere you'd find in New Mexico or Arizona, but certainly not at the place that they are citing. There's also people who confuse El Paso with Eagle Pass, which are extremely far from each other. And there is absolutely no way the governor of a unlawful and fraudulent state corporate empire would ever do something like this because they are in fact all inter uh, in intimately and intricately connected with the uh, criminals that run that border anyway, the UN and all that. The states that we have today, along with federal and all this other nonsense, are the uh, subsidiaries of globalist UN uh, corporate dominance. The only legitimate uh, lawful element that we have left um, or the two, only two legitimate lawful elements that we've left are the people themselves and the U.S. military, which is, of course, the only outfit that swears allegiance to the U.S. Constitution. These other people simply act under the color of it and uh, have no allegiance to it whatsoever. Their allegiance is to foreign, uh, foreign investors, essentially. So I'm not entirely sure what's happening there. All I can say from personal experience is that uh, a lot there's a lot of fake information out about this particular event, whatever it is, and that there's absolutely no way that the governor did it, and that has absolutely nothing to do with quote unquote securing the border because all of this comes in the context of the coercive extortionist uh, monopoly uh, business monopoly uh, based on the immigration um, narrative. My personal experience at that location and uh, other things involved in the corporate immigration business, based off of foreign interests, of course, can be found in my video, The UN Thugs That Control the Border, and it specifies their activities, what the types of individuals are that control that area, and just how vicious, evil, and vile those people are. Now, this brings us to the Immigration Court Practice Manual, which is, uh, this one is from, well, actually does not have the date on it, but it's uh, essentially the ways that the Immigration Court operates. Here, under the uh, section about relationship to the Department of Homeland Security, it states the Department of Homeland Security, DHS, was created in 2003 and assumed most of the functions of the former Immigration and Nationalization Service. DHS is responsible for enforcing immigration laws and administering immigration and naturalization benefits. By contrast, the Immigration Courts and the Board of Immigration Appeals are responsible for independently, notice that word there, independently adjudicating cases under the immigration laws. So that's the important sentence there to look at is where it says independently adjudicating cases under immigration law. Well, laws. Those immigration laws, of course, are foreign imposed and they have absolutely nothing to do with the U.S. Constitution, except they pretend to operate under it based off of only one passage, which is that Congress has the responsibility to uh, provide uniform rules for naturalization and bankruptcy. Not, you know, open-ended or, or open ability to construe that in any way they want so that they can go ahead and violate all other sections of the Constitution, which is the way that the Constitution is used today. They just simply 
cite a passage and then use that and run with it and use it to do all kinds of crimes and do whatever they want, basically. So here, under filing fees, it states, fees for the filing of motions and applications for relief with the immigration court when required are paid to the Department of Homeland Security. Yes, okay. Very independent they are when everything that they they require for being paid, which by the way is direct capitation and in violation of the US Constitution, well, it goes to the Department of Homeland Security. They are hardly independent. Court and the Homeland Security are in fact one and the same because that's the way the money moves. And therefore this is a cut and dry extortion scheme where they use threats, intimidation, fear, and terror to rob people uh, essentially at gunpoint. That is the idea. It is the threat of uniformed armed agents showing up to physically impose force that gets people to pay these fraudulent fees to the Department of Homeland Security for the Immigration Court, which is allegedly, allegedly independent of the Department of Homeland Security. That's just a bold-faced lie. They're not. They're the one in the same. And they are running an extortion racket. They are possibly one of the most criminal enterprises in the United States based off of their coercive efforts, and they are overt terrorists. Now, evidence of this can be found in the way that they institute orders, specifically the removal order. It states, respondent was provided with written notification of the time, date, and location response removal hearing. INA, I know you love that, just removing the human component, calling it respondents. INA 23981. Two, respondent was also provided written warning of the consequences under INA 24B5 that failing to appear at such hearing other than for exceptional circumstances as defined in INA 240C1, or that's E1, may result in a hearing held in respondent's absence and the issuance of an order of removal, provided the Department of Homeland Security establishes by clear, unequivocal, and convincing evidence that respondent is removable and that respondent or respondent's representatives was provided with written notification notification of the hearing as required under INA 239A 1-2, CINA 2440B588CFR 100 or 1003.26. Now that INA is International uh, Immigration and Nationality Act, which is operating under the color of that one section in the Constitution that says that Congress has the uh, responsibility of providing uniform rules for naturalization and um, and bankruptcy. However, they take it and construe it so they can go and uh, violate every section of the Constitution and run their little extortion scheme. Notice it states, provided the Department of Homeland Security establishes by clear, unequivocal, and convincing evidence that blah, blah, blah. Well, the Immigration Court, when you pay their fees, gets paid to the Department of Homeland Security, right? It's ridiculous. This stuff is, is, is just so blatantly criminal. It's... It's quite spectacular, and it, but it's it's it is terrorism, but it directly uh, directly violates the preamble of the U.S. Constitution, which has to do with domestic tranquility, because this is by far some of the most inflammatory operations that could possibly, or most insightful operations that could happen, where they are in fact trying to uh, force a situation by running their you know, if, if you don't adhere to their unlawful edicts, then they're basically threatening you with all the stuff and try and incite a violent conflict. That is the aspect of this because they want to send, uh, obviously the people behind this won't ever get their hands dirty, but they want to send ignorant individuals, thugs, to go and belligerate a violent situation, depending obviously on the fear of most people to simply go meekly along with whatever nonsense they want to do. Uh, here we have the signature page, and there are four pages. The signature page simply has DW uh, for the immigration judge, David Whipple. That's not a signature. That is a, uh, those are initials. And it's very important to notice the way that the initials are written there because it's not handwritten. It is, in fact, photocopied. So this is simply a unsigned document which is part of a system and it was processed allegedly allegedly by patricia mclean court staff that's the only document which actually has a person's name on it 
which has to do with, of course, the if you're going to do it constitutionally, it has to be signed under oath and affirmation, right? Which they don't ever do that. They all just pretend. It's just a pretend structure of fraudulent corporate agents who are carrying out terrorist activities based on behalf of foreign interests. Now, here's the next uh, set of pages on this uh, so-called removal order. It states, attached is a copy of the decision of the immigration judge as a result of your failure to appear at your scheduled deportation or removal hearing, right? If you don't show up, then which you do show up and they'll railroad you and hold your body as surety because you to them are sim is simply cattle to be squeezed of all the funds and thing everything of value you have. Uh, it says this decision is final unless a motion to reopen is filed in accordance with section blah, 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 immigration and nationality, blah, 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 deportation proceedings. Yeah, so on and so forth. Then they give this uh, superior avenue address because there are superiors, right? Here on the last page, you get your threats, right? It, it states the immigration court further finds that respondents' failure to appear to proceed with any applications for relief constitutes an abandonment of any pending applications for relief or protections from removal and of any applications the respondent may have been eligible to file. So this is akin to uh mafia or organized criminal outfits going around and smashing up someone's building and then saying pay us or or we won't protect you right you will, basically we won't protect you from us so that's what this is it's a, a clean cut and dry extortion protection racket pretty much where they basically say pay us all this money or we're going to abuse you and do all of these nasty things to you so like here, failure to depart. If respondent is subject to a final order of removal, it willfully fails or refuses to depart from the United States pursuant to the immigration court's order to make timely application in good faith for travel or other documents necessary to depart the United States to present themselves at the time and place required for removal by the DHS or conspires to or takes any action designed to prevent or hamper their departure pursuant to the order of removal. Respondent shall be subject to a civil monetary penalty for each day respondent is in violation pursuant to blah, blah, blah. Respondent is removable pursuant to blah, blah, blah. Then respondent shall be further fined and or imprisoned up to 10 years. And again, that signature there is a, it's a initial that matches almost exactly the other one, which show, shows you that it's a photocopy. It is not actually handwritten. Processed by Patricia McLean court staff. So there you get your, your threats acting under the color of law. But the thing is, they're acting under the color of their law. They're basically doing whatever they want. Basically, they put out an order and they say, if you don't follow it, then we're going to do all this nasty stuff to you. And it has absolutely nothing to do with following the Constitution, the supreme law of the land, to which everyone in the armed forces wears an oath of allegiance. So now we're going to look at a letter that I previously sent to the U.S. Army Reserve Command Headquarters, Fort Liberty, North Carolina, detailing some of these uh, activities, shall we say. Of course, this predates the so-called removal order. Report on operations of foreign influence apparently detrimental to interests of the United States of America. Good evening, sir or ma'am. My name is Stephen Coleman Rausch, and I am an honorably discharged veteran of the United States Marine Corps, reaching out in duty to my oath of enlistment and out of allegiance to the U.S. Constitution. The troubling elements that are contained within this report relate to all Americans, so I took the liberty of sending this report to the most appropriate authority as according to the United States Army and Navy Manual of Military Government and Civil Affairs, dated the 22nd of December, 1943. Civil Affairs component would deal with matters of national emergency and the declaration of martial law, or military law. As the United States Civil Affairs component falls under the purview of the Army Reserve, this seems to be the most applicable authority to submit such a report. If this report was submitted in error, I respectfully request that such a report be sent to a more appropriate individual, as the information contained within holds important implications for all of us that call this country our home. Thank you, Stephen Komarash, Marine veteran, father, author, and linguist. Report on operations of foreign influence, apparently detrimental to the interests of the United States of America. Disclaimer, some of the work referenced in this letter is intellectual property, protected by copyright, and is instituted under the Fair Use Act or otherwise applicable law, with full faith and credit given to the property owners. Here we have our table of contents, purpose of the report, subversive operations of education, international investment and stakeholders, activities at the U.S.-Mexico border, U.S. consulates and embassies, statement of character, and appendix. Purpose of the report. 
Foreign influence may not be of issue, but when it comes as a detriment to the United States of America, as formed by the constituting document, the nation and the country, such a circumstance would become a concern of the armed forces of the United States, as directed in the presidential oath of office in the Constitution, in addition to applicable articles and amendments. As stipulated in the U.S. Constitution's preamble, one of the primary purposes to the supreme law of the land is the ensuring of domestic tranquility, otherwise known as maintaining the peace. Within the United States Army and Navy Manual of Military Government and Civil Affairs, marked 22nd of December 1943, it states under Section 3, Subsection B, that as the military occupation of enemy territory suspends the operation of the enemy's civil government, it is an obligation under international law for the occupying force to exercise the functions of civil government in the restoration and maintenance of public order. This wording here seems to fall in line with domestic tranquility charge of the U.S. Constitution, despite only referencing international law. Domestic tranquility is the primary purpose of this report to better facilitate the obligations of the U.S. Constitution in the effective displacement of adversaries to said document, the nation, and the country. In the same, all that is referenced in this document will be provided in the interest of preserving peace and the proper establishment of lawful and legitimate governance. As such, this report will be one way in which personal duty as bound by oath or affirmation to the U.S. Constitution will be accomplished. Such an oath is stipulated for the Commander-in-Chief in Article 2, Section 1 of the U.S. Constitution, where it states, Before he enter on the execution of his office, he shall take the following oath or affirmation. I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will faithfully execute the office of the President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. While the oath of, the enlist of enlistment into the U.S. Marine Corps may vary slightly from the wording in this oath, it does charge allegiance to the U.S. Constitution, which is binding in perpetuity, thus containing no time limit on such application. Therefore, out of duty to the oath of the enlistment, this port is report is respectfully submitted to the appropriate authority. Subversive operations of education. The university is of primary concern when it comes to foreign influence of a detrimental nature. The Manual of Military Government and Civil Affairs previously referenced contains a short section that pertains to the subject of education. Under Section 2, Civil Affairs Responsibility, Subsection 12V, it states the prevention of subversive or harmful instruction. Of course, education is the bed bedrock upon which common understanding is situated, and the events detailed in this report re or present an organizational operation with those two elements at the core objective, which are subversive and harm to domestic tranquility. Apart from the elements of division within the programs of the university institution, the control structure of modern education as a whole appears to not only be antagonistic, but inimical to the purposes of domestic sovereignty. Unfortunately, the depth of damage to the nation and the U.S. Constitution implemented by subversive education appears to penetrate all the way to the understanding of language and definition. Subversion of words in the U.S. Constitution drive the document to take on a different character, and readers of today will hold a different understanding of the supreme law of the land, an understanding that the original writers never intended. An apparent example is in the use of the word domestic violence, which has come to mean a spouse, generally male, bringing violence against the violence against their significant other. Where such an activity might be contained within the term domestic tranquility, the general use in police regulations and procedure has come to only mean marital conflict of a violent nature, whether that violence be in place through voice or action. However, the basis for such subversion of law, uh, lawful language will easily, easily be found within the legal scholar sphere of the education system since licensed attorneys are those that present the face of the legal profession today thus ensuring the U.S. Constitution as their practical property for education to the public. The University of Nebraska Kearney is the primary location where evidence is derived for this section of the report. However, other corroborative evidence suggests the same, which is the organizational structure of the university system is operating against the populace of the United States and the U.S. Constitution. The other universities which will have activities cited in this report include the Grand Canyon University and the Ohio State University. Within their curriculums, the subversive education that takes place can be best found within the example of Grand Canyon University's GCU pledge of being an international citizen. The University of Nebraska Kearney's UNK public speaking test that argued about the moral implications of torture by a teacher named Ford Clark and discriminatory behavior against veterans of the U.S. Armed Forces at The Ohio State University, OSU, by a teacher named Hillary Denner, or Degner. 
These three examples in conjunction with others present a clear danger to domestic tranquility and appear to constitute the subversive education that is referenced in the Military Government and Civil Affairs Manual from the 1940s. Torture as a School Subject was the title of a published video that documents some of the subversive education at the University of Nebraska Kearney. Apart from this video, others were published about UNK titled A National Security Concern, Self-Appointed Justices, and Caught Red-Handed. These four videos about the University of Nebraska Kearney were prefaced with the school name in their titles in conjunction the video title The Torture of Education Details Evidence of Subversive Activity in relation to this and other institutions. However, not all examples of subversive education that took place were detailed within these videos, simply those that contained hard evidence, mostly based on the proverbial paper trail. A public speaking class at the University of Nebraska Kearney published to the students a test that stated, quote, to persuade my audience that torture is morally justifiable in cases in which lives are at stake is a specific purpose statement for a persuasive speech on a question of, unquote, reference three. And then it proceeded to list four multiple choice answers in addition at the University of Nebraska Kearney implied corruption and system, quote unquote, was given as a reason for the rendering of a bad grade. Furthermore, when these and other events were brought to the attention of the faculty up to the University of Nebraska Kearney's Board of Regents, a hostility was to be found such as one might find when addressing an open adversary. Thinking like an adversary was the description of the cyber class at UNK des designated, quote, uh, CYBR 435, reverse engineering, thinking like an adversary, unquote. Reference 5. Of course, isolated, the majority of these events may appear innocent and ordinary. However, joined together, these incidents present a subversive program which is designed to weaponize the education system against the nation, country, and the U.S. Constitution. The Ohio State University provides the first elements for this section of the report. Chronologically, the evidence that is derived from the Ohio State University establishes the theme of subversive education as a long-standing operation, as well as an organizational one. The saying that Rome wasn't built in a day applies here, where the operations are subver of subversive education did not become embedded overnight. It took a long time to establish such a damaging educational system, and evidence of this can be found in the Cardinal Principles of Secondary Education a report by the Commission on the Reorganization of Secondary Education appointed by the National Education Association, Bulletin 1911, number 35. Here it states, the purpose of democracy is to, to organize society that each member may develop his personality primarily through activities designed for the well-being of his fellow members and of society as a whole. While this report predates the Soviet Union, the same type of language can be found in Soviet studies on behavior modification. And the consequence of this objective is seen today. Where an English teacher affords a punitive grade for a school project presentation on the damaging propaganda around post-traumatic stress disorder in veterans, said report detailed the profiling of veterans as violent individuals lacking in self-control and referenced how mefloquine carried side effects that were attributed to post-traumatic stress disorder. As expected, there were repercussions for this report and the conversation and the awarding of a punitive punitive grade is added to this report in the exhibits. The international component becomes manifested through the Grand Canyon University's Global Citizens Pledge, which is enforced upon any unfortunate students that become part of this institution's student body. However, it is clear that all elements of the education system correlate for an overall impact of subversion and damage with the inherent benefit to foreign interests. This would, all be, all, this would also be apparent in the public speaking exam that was referenced before where clearly manipulative language is employed to damage perception toward the portation or carrying of personal arms with a clear consequence of weakening the nation's martial strength and removing the proverbial a rifle behind every blade of grass. Reference three. The reduction of the nation's martial strength would allow for an easier transition to overt global rule and the removal of such a thing as a U.S. citizen, in addition to the practical enforcement of the U.S. Constitution, the document to which members of U.S. Armed Forces and the Commander-in-Chief swear allegiance. In the book, The Presence of the Past, Morphic Resonance, and the Habits of Nature, Rupert Sheldrake presents the counterparts of eugenic study by the National Socialists of Germany in the 30s and 40s, whereby humans could be managed through a focus on physical attributes, Conversely, the Soviet Union focused studies on human modification through aspects of behavior and the collective conscious. Of course, both of these patterns of study are starkly present today in the United States, and one of the easiest, easiest examples is use of the crosswalk, where the local populace becomes reduced to cattle, considering the crosswalk was originally called a cattle guard. 
this insidious removal of constitutionally protected liberty without due process of law finds a basis in the subversive education system and their programs of behavior modification. In the aforementioned book by Rupert Sheldrake, it explained as intangible social influences are a matter of common experiences. experience. Many phrases in everyday language refer to them, the power of tradition, peer group pressure, the force of conformity, and so on. All of us have experienced the feelings of shame that are associated with social disapproval and the positive feelings engendered by social approval. And we are familiar with the invisible influences referred to by terms such as solidarity, loyalty, morale, and team spirit. The solution to this problem requires a degree of creativity, and one thing is certain, left in its current state, these operations of subversive education will continue to do damage, and one can only hope that such harm may be reversible. A logical solution would incorporate a dispersion of the effects that have been opposed through this manipulation of the collective conscious. One way this can be done is by disrupting the trained modifiers that enforce such subversive education through the awarding of bad grades for behavior that is against selection or in disagreement with the arbitrary viewpoint of the controllers, rather than judging work based off its quality within reality. Fortunately, a solution presents itself within the veteran body that we find today, where many merge practical understanding from experience with the comprehension of current civil problems. As such, a veteran would be well suited to subvert the damage that has been done within the education system and reinstitute the concepts of individual liberty as afforded by the Constitution. Of course, the structure itself must be disrupted, or a day will come when constitutional sovereignty ceases to be a question. A note of caution would be prudent when it comes to the subject of disrupting the current education regime. The education system is not only built to be sustainable, but it is also the insulated equilibrium of the international adversary. As such, the children which come under the control of these faculties become practical hostages. Any threat of rebellion is often met by a threat to the children of the education administration. There is a great degree of evidence to prove that social educators of today have no reservations about using what falls under their administration in a different way than, original, than the original intention. The most apparent example of this can be found with the University of Nebraska Kearney, where the faculty senate sought to establish their own court system with the basis of their control becoming coming from the misappropriation and mis misuse of information that was submitted for a different purpose. Here, the school administration decided they would use the personal student information in unlawful court proceedings, originally given under the pretense of use in administration of student education. In connection with the formal investigation of a grievance, it shall be considered a legitimate educational and institutional interest for the committee to examine any university personnel and student records considered by any person or body in taking the action or making the decision which is the subject of a grievance, quote unquote. With the consideration of other evidence and the fact that these individuals take no issue with the misuse of confidential information, one can only imagine what they would do in the self-guided administration of the physical aspects under their charge, especially when any challenge to their declared authority over the student body. As such, any intervention would require the removal of any possible hostages under the purview of such individuals, especially when it comes to the preservation of human life. International Investment and Stakeholders Shell corporations throughout the United States generally reach a troubling conclusion. The pattern that unfolds is hidden ownership by international investors. This type of issue is especially troubling when it comes to local markets. Through analysis of business records and other corroborative research, the appearance of complete foreign control in U.S. business appears to manifest itself. While finding the links to such a scheme might take some effort, the overall system appears simple and straightforward. A system of relays is used where business documentation will funnel through the state of Delaware. Mostly an effort to un uncover evidence outside the U.S. is necessary after running into the blockage of Delaware State's corporate protection. Either way, it is apparent that foreign investment interests would seek to protect their property within the U.S. considering the executive order on foreign interference in U.S. elections. In Executive Order 13848, it stipulates, including as appropriate and consistent with applicable law, Proposed sanctions with respect to the largest business entities licensed or domiciled in a country whose government authority authorized, directed, sponsored, or supported election interference. Extensive foreign interference in the ability for U.S. citizens and all Americans to choose is a clear reason why the nation is very far from the domestic tranquility of the U.S. Constitution. Under the guise of keeping peace, numerous organizations instigate and facilitate situations of conflict. 
like the immigration court, where the clear interest of foreign entities be involved. At the heart of the situation, foreign involvement appears to stem from the pretext of investment, which is then liberally construed to mean ownership. Thus, the entirety of the United States is claimed as the private property of foreign entities. These investments are then enforced through practical measures at local levels, where the general culprit reaches back to Swiss interests, those being of individuals that are based out of Switzerland. Such a pattern of evidence is, is, is exhibited throughout multiple videos that have been published on the subject under the moniker S.C. Coleman author. However, the clearest example of this corporation can be found with the alleged code enforcement of the city of Logan in the state of Ohio. Under a notice about alleged violations of an imposed renter's permit, the stipulated authority was listed as International Building Maintenance Code. After further research, one will find that such a code is property of the Interna International Code Council, a private organization that will reach back to individuals in Switzerland. This enforced operation relates to international investment in the United States, then construed as ownership, and it completely undercuts and violated multiple elements in the U.S. Constitution. Furthermore, the enforcing of such codes as local law violate the very basis of domestic sovereignty. Worse still, such act activities instill a state of agitation among the local populace of Logan, which will inevitably lead to conflict against the U.S. Constitution's charge of domestic tranquility. However, this is no isolated instigation, as such elements can be discovered in various parts across the nation, and nearly always stemming from alleged points of authority, such as city councils, state agents, and numerous police elements or the Immigration Court. <laughs> the City Council of Waco in the state of Texas instigated an alleged conflict between the motorcycle club, the Banditos, and police officers. This came about through the passing of a local city ordinance that was targeted at smoking in outdoor patio areas. The subsequent shootout is a clear consequence, likely intentionally instigated by the attempted enforcement of such an ordinance, reference 12. Whether or not such an ordinance is lawful is of little consequence in this regard because it and other elements lead to the instigation of conflict and violent confrontation, apparent to the benefit of a network of Swiss actors that bring a great deal of harm to the nation. While the ordinance itself was dated after the alleged shootout, the passing of such an ordinance in the same year is very telling. Such a situation is dire and commends in commands intervention from the armed forces of the United States, considering how all members members swear allegiance to such a document an oath which does not state an expiration continuing in perpetuity so it states in article 4 section 4 the united states shall guarantee against domestic violence considering the outcomes of similar operations it is not the local populace that poses as the belligerent as is usually reported instead they are members of city councils using the coercive threat of force from police officers which instigate conflict, apparently on behalf of interests foreign to the United States. The proverbial destruction of a distant place where those that live far away from the location will not feel the consequence of their actions. In Article 3, Section 3 of the U.S. Constitution, it defines treason as, Treason against the United States shall consist only in levying war against them or in adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort. Reference to, quote unquote, Clear implications in armed conflict which stem from the enforcement of such ordinances can only be construed as the levying of war because of the benefit that loss of life holds for adversaries of the United States. Interference by Switzerland can be found as a pattern through the corroborative documentation of business filing. Two specific filings will form the basis for this declaration, proving the apparent detrimental influ influence of the international operations, apparently designed to destabilize and harm the domestic tranquility of the United States. The first piece of evidence that establishes connection to Switzerland are the names Jan Kies van der Wielde and Paul McNewer, Swiss nationals that were listed under the business filings for Volcafe, or Volcafe, which provided the products for Coffee Geeks, a brand of coffee being sold at the local Keller market in Lancaster, Ohio, where said market promotes itself as only carrying local products, reference 13. Next, the organization known as Ivanic Degusa International AG is found in connection to the Ohio Guidestone Program, an entity of the alleged local government, where the Ivanic Degusa business filings in the United King Kingdom listed as incorporated in Switzerland. In conjunction, the individual named Klaus Rettig being listed in a Virginia business filing with only a Virginia post office box, but no listing of foreign affiliation where said individual was also listed in the Swiss filings from the United Kingdom, reference 14. 
Considering the scope and level of harmful infiltration within the United States, the U.S. Armed Forces are practically the only entities with the organizational capability to combat such a problem, where the destabilization of local authority makes local resistance to said international operations improbable. The final addition to this section of the report comes from a business filing for named Goldschmidt Chemical Corporation in the state of Virginia. In this filing, it states that the CT Corporation system is a Volters Kluver company. There are many business filings for various entities containing the name Volters Kluver, but a basic open source search will present the Volters Kluver company as none other than a foreign one based out of the Netherlands. Considering the heavy and broad involvement of foreign interests which relate back to Switzerland, it would be probable that the or it would be probably that the Volters Kluver company does as well. Unfortunately, no hard evidence of the Volters Kluver company's ties to Switzerland has yet surfaced for this report. On the other hand, the CT Corporation system, being a subsidiary of a foreign management group, is extremely disturbing and of great importance. The CT Corporation system is a bulk ser agent service which provides the filing services for a considerable number of corporate entities throughout the United States. Effectively, through their leveraging of the CT Corporation system, a foreign interest has great control over the commerce of the United States through the services that they provide. Considering the depth of involvement in other areas, this level of influence in the corporate sphere does not come as a surprise, but it is indeed very troubling. Activities at the U.S.-Mexico border, U.S. consulates and embassies. Experience-based evidence will form the majority of this section of this report. Due to the nature of the locations and institutions involved, the derivation of hard evidence was feasibly problematic. Apart from prohibitions on recording at many of these locations, little comes in the way of experience reduced to writing. So, for the purpose of this report, the character of the individual will have to suffice for valid validation of the alleged situation. In beginning this section, it would be best to start from the chronological point of U.S. embassies and consulates within the country of Mexico and Ecuador. First, the U.S. Embassy in Quito, Ecuador, contained no demonstrated presence of United States citizen administration. Where the front gate was staffed by locals, all with the hostile dispositions and unprofessional demeanors. Here, the security of foreign nationals at the U.S. Embassies in Quito retained an unhelpful manner and would not facilitate the questions of a U.S. citizen. In conjunction, the U.S. Embassy in Mexico City also had an outward security that was staffed only by locals, with no demonstrated presence of the United States beside the flag of the Stars and Stripes, which was still present in the building's exterior. Finally, upon entering the U.S. Consulate in Merida, Mexico, it became evident that no U.S. citizen administered the facility. The processing of a consular report of birth abroad was completed by a British national, apparent in the spoken accent of the individual who was an older person with graying hair. In addition, the revision of presented paperwork was conducted by a Mexican gentleman who used a hostile tone in questioning about previous military, ex military service in the United States Marine Corps. Meanwhile, the interior and exterior security of the U.S. Consulate in Merida was staffed by local security forces. No U.S. Marines nor any other U.S.-based security was present at this locale. Supervisory Agent Tapia was the U.S. Customs and Border Protection agent that supervised the second bridge crossing at Eagle Pass, Texas. She supervised this post with another individual that had gold oak leaves on his shoulder, a symbol that relates to the rank of major in the United States Marine Corps. This individual is named Rodriguez, and there only appeared to be two alleged supervisors on the particular shift at this bridge. During the period of crossing on the 3rd of July, 2023, however, upon crossing at the first bridge, the agents of the post leveraged the accusation of presenting false documentation after directing us into a holding room. Then my family was separated where the mother and child in question were transported to the second bridge. Upon arrival at the second bridge, the staff appeared to know nothing of the situation, nor the existence of the child and mother named Camelia Suhishuka Coleman Roush Calle and Brenda Gardenia Calle San Martin, respectively. However, after notifying the agent at the front desk that separation of families is a crime, in addition to the trafficking of children, the agents on post suddenly presented their awareness and delivered the said child forthwith. However, out of clear contempt, all on the shift refused to process the paperwork for the mother, holding her until a shift at said post changed. During such time, the mother was treated to the worst that the postcards could muster, including extended isolation in a cold room and being given in inadequate sustenance for the time spent at this border crossing post. Apart from personal abuse, other considerations are involved. First, both supervisors, A. Tapia and Rodriguez, repeated the same sentiment. Neither cared what might happen to any of us, which included two U.S. citizens, myself and my daughter. 
Also, the two individuals appear to retain a shared contempt for myself, my daughter, and the mother involved. It is probable that these two individuals, Tapia and Rodriguez, hold equal contempt for the United States and those that populate its shores. A very disturbing aberration for those that present the face of the nation and control access into and outside the country. In the case of Tapia, after being informed that the activity at this post was apparently criminal, she stated that presence at the post was her privilege and she revoked the right of speech based upon this presupposition, a clear violation of the Constitution's protection of liberty not to be deprived without due process. The personal jurisdiction of Tapia through holding of hostages and threat of force does not constitute the due process of which the U.S. Constitution speaks. After requesting access to the mother for purposes of nursing the infant, U.S. citizen Camelia Suhishuga Coleman Rashkaye, the supervisor Rodriguez proceeded to state that he did not care and to feed the child formula. At this point, any objections to the use of formula, health considerations or otherwise, would go ignored, considering the supervisor stipulated that he did not care. These two individuals both stated that they did not care, a sentiment that appeared to be shared by all staff at this post, at least during the time of our presence at this post. Every half hour attempts to make a patrol of the station were met by contemptuous and hostile address. First, the agents at the post restricted the ability to wait outside of their facility, causing the necessity to check in at every half hour interval. Each time the agents repeated similar statements that said mother would be let go when she was let go and continuous questioning about the situation would be a futile effort. Despite this, following about four hours of routine visits, one agent stated that the mother was being processed and would be released shortly. However, upon her return, the agents became increasingly hostile and stated that said mother would not, in fact, be released soon and that she would be processed when she would be processed. Once released, I was informed that all said agents on post had refused to process said mother out of clear contempt for us and our presence there. In addition, one agent, even antagonistically, noted that routine visits involved going around and questioning other agents about an answer that had already been given. Clearly, all agents at this post shared the same sentiments as Tapia and Rodriguez, that this post was their personal domain and they could administer it in any way they saw fit, essentially making them the law of the location. With this in mind, one can only wonder what other anti-American operations are taking place here and at any location that the alleged U.S. Customs and Border Protection might control, considering the organizational scope of the contempt that was shown here, as with the so-called Immigration Court allegedly independent. <laughs> Another crime committed at this post was that act of fraud, where it was signed on the release paperwork that said individual Brenda Gardena Calle San Martin had the paperwork explained in Spanish, where the actual explanation was de delivered in English. Regardless of the listener's grasp of the English language, the wording of these documents can be found as overly complicated, thus requiring such to be presented in one's native language. However, the biggest issue here is that a lie was formed when the paperwork was signed with the statement that such an address was delivered in Spanish. Proceed, reference 16. Perceiving the disturbing experience at Eagle Pass, Texas, a highly suspect and inflammatory letter arrived through the normal mail process, process which was an alleged notice of in-person hearing from the alleged Cleveland Immigration Court, apparently a part of the United States Department of Justice, Executive Office for Immigration Review. In this document, it attempts to use the threat of deportation to coerce personal appearance, stating if you fail to appear at your hearing, the Department of Homeland Security establishes by clear, unequivocal, and convincing evidence that written notice of your hearing was provided and that you are removable, you will be ordered removed from the United States. Exception to these rules are only for exceptional circumstances. Quote, unquote, reference 16. The wording here shares the same contempt for law as the declaration of Tapia and Rodriguez's privilege, which is not surprising which is not surprising that organizationally these individuals believe they are the law and the United States Constitution means nothing. In the alleged court's letter, it states that evidence of written notice is enough for the ordered removal, as though such a thing were a crime. However, what is being done here is clearly criminal, violating the U.S. Constitution in multiple parts. Violations of the U.S. Constitution include the Ninth Amendment. The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny, deny or disparage others retained by the people. The Tenth Amendment, the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited to it, it by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. Reference two. They always ignore that part about the people. Here, the only provisional article in the Constitution that forms a pretext for these impositions stems from Congress's charge to establish a uniform rule of naturalization. 
While the charge is not a privilege, despite being construed as such, even if it were a legitimate claim, such actions would be barred by the Ninth and Tenth Amendments. Finally, in addition to all other violations of the U.S. Constitution, such activity is clearly detrimental to domestic tranquility and will guarantee a state of terror which would lead to instigation of domestic violence. Any such unlawful order in an attempt to enforce it against myself and my family will induce the expected response of armed resistance. However, removing myself will not remove the threat to domestic tranquility, as these organizations clearly form the role of belligerents in the situation. Left as they are, such institutions will continue to harass and agitate all those that appear within their declared privilege. This is no isolated situation, as such conflict is being agitated in nearly every scope and level of domestic life, as referenced in earlier sections of this report. Such harm and damage will continue while individuals that run these organizations are left unchallenged and unchecked. In most cases, the most criminal elements appear as the legal administrators of law and order. As a last note, it would be prudent to point out that the issued document from the alleged Immigration Court of Cleveland was only presented to English and was neither sent through registered nor certified mail. It was also unsigned and no names were appended to the document. Statement of Character and Signature Stephen Christopher Wright Coleman Rouse served an aggregate of seven years in the United States Marine Corps, five being served on active duty and two in the reserve. Although honorably discharged, reference 18, the oath given at enlistment will charge duty in perpetuity without date of expiration. Growing up in Ohio, said named individual was a has a spotless driving record, left void of any traffic-related violations, reference 19. He retains no criminal record and was awarded the Good Conduct Medal, reference 20. These elements prove content of character and an impeccable degree of elevated conduct. While in the Marine Corps, said named individual achieved the rank of E4 Corporal, reference 21, and completed the Corporal's course on leadership and ethics, reference 22. Also, said named individual is presented with a certificate of appreciation from the United States Marine Corps 2nd Marine Expeditionary Force Battle Simulation Center, reference 23. While Stephen Coleman Rouse retains other accolades from service and beyond, these should suffice to establish evidence of trustworthy and responsible character. Any further materials to establish character will be respectfully given upon request by the appropriate party. Signed, Stephen Coleman Rouse, Marine Veteran, Father, Author, and Linguist, October 8th, 2023. Well, it's not technically signed. It's, you know, I, I forgot to sign it. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, it's, um, it's there. Appendix of references, I will not include all of these as they have been stipulated in other videos, most of them, and also it would take up a lot of time in this video. Now, here are the so-called uh, the notice of hearing that was received and referenced in that video, or that section of the video, the uh, report to the Army Reserve Command. It states, um, <clears throat> notice of in-person hearing, your case has been scheduled for master hearing before the immigration court on blah, 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 at that place. Uh, you know, it's got all of the legal uh, appearance to it, right? The the acting under color of law crap. Representation, you may, may be represented in these proceedings at no expense to the government by an attorney or other representative of your choice who is authorized and qualified to represent persons before an immigration court. If you are represented, your attorney or representative must also appear at your hearing and be ready to proceed with your case. Enclosed and online at blah, 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 proponal pro bono crap, right? So it's all a fraudulent coercion extortion system. So there's nothing that's free. There's no such thing as pro bono. Well, pro bono means actually for bono, which might be benefit. I'm not entirely sure, but pro is for. So failure to appear. If you fail to appear at your hearing and the Department of Homeland Security establishes by clear, unequivocal and convincing evidence that written notice of your hearing was provided and that you are removable, you will be ordered removed from the United States. Exception to these rules are only for exceptional circumstances. That section was, in fact, uh, referenced in that letter and is um, clearly unlawful extortion there. And of course, naturally, again, the fees that you pay to this court are addressed to the Department of Homeland Security. So there you go. The change of address, the court will send all correspondence, including hearing notice to you based on the uh, most recent contact information you have provided, and your immigration proceedings can go forward in your absence if you do not appear before the court. Yeah, that's not lawful. If your contact information is missing or is incorrect on the notice to appear, you must provide the immigration court with your updated contact information within five days of receipt of that notice so you do not miss important information. 
Each time your address, telephone number, or email address changes, you must inform the Immigration Court within five days. To update your contact information from the Immigration Court, you must complete a form EOIR 33, blah, blah, blah. Internet-based hearings, so on and so forth. Clearly antagonistic and belligerent on its face. Now, this is the notice to appear that you find with uh, crossing the border. And it states, the Department of Homeland Security alleges that you, uh, you are not a U.S. citizen national of the United States. You are a native of blah, 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 and citizen of blah, blah, blah. You applied uh, for admission on 0703-2023 at Eagle Pass, Texas, USA. You are an immigrant not in possession of a valid unexpired immigrant visa, reentry permit, border crossing card, or other valid entry document required by the Immigration and Nationality Act. And you are uh, an immigrant not in possession of a valid unexpired passport or other suitable travel document or document of identity and nationality. So that obviously is part of their uh, extortion scheme where all of that stuff you pay to the Department of Homeland Security to see, keep their corporate, uh, corrupt corporate system operating, right? And when you don't do it, then they abuse you and treat you like garbage and would prefer to kill you if they had enough pretext to do so. Of course, I would actually feel like justice would be served if these morons that run this stuff were all executed uh, lawfully, of course, right? You have to follow the Constitution. They don't have to it, have to follow it because they're acting under color of it. But the Constitution was, in fact, uh, put there for the purpose of domestic tranquility, which they don't care about. <clears throat> and then, of course, this was signed by a CBP officer. Warning, any statement you make may be used against you in removal proceedings. That's like the Miranda rights, which are also bogus, but also sounds a lot like the uh, University of Nebraska Security Senate faculty court that they were setting up. They had the had like Miranda rights written. <laughs> it's so stupid. This stuff's crazy. Uh, here it's got all the, it's got your failure to appear threat. You're required to provide the Department of Homeland Security, DHS, in writing with your full mailing address and telephone number. You must notify the Immigration Court and the DHS immediately by using form EOIR33 whenever you change your address or telephone number during the course of this proceeding. You will be provided with a copy of this form. Notices of hearing will be mailed to this address. If you do not submit form EOIR33 and do not otherwise provide an address at which you may be reached during proceedings, then the government shall not be required to provide you with written notice of your hearing. Of course, that government is not a lawful government. It's a fraudulent corporate one running an extortion racket. If you fail to attend a hearing at the time and place designated on this notice or any date and time later directed by the immigration court, a removal order may be made by the immigration judge in your absence and you may be arrested and detained by the DHS. That is an overtly inflammatory threat. It also forms the basis for a letter of reprisal, which only the U.S. Congress, according to the Constitution, is allowed to make. No one else. These people are not allowed to issue letters of reprisal under the U.S. Constitution, but considering they are acting under foreign laws, well, they don't follow any laws except what they believe to be their own. And then, of course, we have mandatory duty to surrender for removal. If you become subject to a final order of removal, DHS office listed on the Internet at ICE gut.gov contact blah 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 as directed by the dhs and required by statute and regulation immigration regulations at 8 cfr blah 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 define when the removal order becomes administratively final if you are granted voluntary departure and fail to you fail to depart the united states as required or yeah as required failure to post a bond in connection with voluntary departure yes you know pay us money or well arrest you and treat you like crap and you probably won't leave alive because that's how these people are they are all about hostage taking or fail to comply with any other condition or term in connection with voluntary departure you must surrender for removal on the next business day thereafter if you do not surrender for removal as required you will be ineligible for all forms of discretionary relief as long as you remain in the united states and for 10 years after your departure or removal this means you will be ineligible for asylum, cancellation of removal, voluntary departure, adjustment status, change of non-immigrant status, registry, and other related waivers for the period. If you do not surrender for removal as requested, you may be criminally prosecuted under Section 243 of the Immigration and Nationality Act. Yeah, so go figure. They are simply operating under the color of law. They are running an extortion and racketeering scheme. But most importantly, they are human traffickers. 
they kidnap people under fraudulent pretense and each and every individual involved in the system should be summarily arrested and executed if there is justice to be served because what they are doing is enemy operations of warfare Here's their authority statement. The Department of Homeland Security, through U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, U.S. Customs and Border Protection, CBP, and U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, USCIS, are authorized to collect the information requested on this form pursuant to Sections 103, 237, 239, blah, 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 of the Immigration and Nationality Act. Boy, do they like to hide behind that a lot, right? They use that one tiny section in the U.S. Constitution to provide themselves with all these privileges and abilities to do whatever the hell they want to anyone and all for what is always at the basis of all of these schemes, money, money and control. They want your money and if you don't pay them, then they are going to abuse you in every way they can until you pay them and if you don't pay them, then they'll just kill you. And of course, if you resist them, then they'll kill you, but it should be the other way around. If they resist the people, they should all die because they are, in fact, resisting the people. They're doing everything in the face of the U.S. Constitution and the interest of domestic tranquility and U.S. citizens and veterans, and everyone. They just do whatever the hell they want. It's, yeah, you know, they're enemies. They really are. They're just blatant over enemies. So here we get the last part where it states that... <clears throat> 212A, 7A, I, I, all that, of the Immigration Nationality Act, as amended as an immigrant who at the time of application for admission is not in possession of a valid, unexpired immigrant visa, reentry permit, border crossing card, or other valid entry document required by the Act, and valid, unexpired passport, or other suitable travel document, or document of identity and nationality as required under the regulations issued by the Attorney General under Section blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So, more of this corporate Gestapo garbage. Now, originally I had filed the petition for the fiancé in good faith, and I took a screenshot at the time where it stated 16.5 months for processing, right? And it started at a lower time and it kept incrementally increasing. So I decided, oh, these people are absolutely never going to process this paperwork, even though I already paid them their extortion money, which was almost $600. And they have ridiculous amounts of money that they provide for the extortion of these things, all flying in the face, of course, the Constitution, just like all the fraudulent taxes that we are subjected to without a choice, like sales tax, for instance. So what's interesting about this is that when I was at the border, that um, piece of garbage, Tapia, she told me that with the way that we were crossing, right, um, we would lose the so-called fiance visa but after we crossed we kept getting these mailings for said document so this is a now here's the interesting part is that on the application i had submitted for the for merida right merida in mexico which is where we were living which is all the way at the bottom of mexico on in the yucatan peninsula on the gulf well, actually, I believe it's the Gulf. Uh, I'd have to double check that on map. Anyway, there's only one part, only one part of this letter that's in Spanish, which says, Favor de presentar una copia de esta carta el día de su cita. So that doesn't say por favor, which is please. It just says favor, which is favor. And it just says to present a copy of this at your, um, at your appointment. <laughs> really stupid. It says your visa case is now ready for processing. Please go to travel, blah, blah, blah. Select CDJ Ciudad Juarez Consulate. Juarez is very far from Merida. And in no place at all on the filing document did I ever stipulate that location. So that's just sort of weird. Weird. I don't really know what it might mean. You know, I can speculate about what it would mean. But it definitely falls in line with all of the weirdness that has to do with these uh, so-called immigration people. Now, coming to the code enforcement people, here we have a document uh, which it comes from the meeting minutes for the City Council of Logan. An ordinance amending ordinance number 14, 2013 to make the code enforcement officer position a full-time position and repeating parts of the ordinance inconsistent therewith. Driscoll moved to pass the ordinance, which was seconded by Chapman, 
After a roll call vote, the motion passed, all voting yay. And as stipulated before, these code enforcement people are going around and harassing the local populace, agitating the conflict and situation for the purposes of extorting and stealing, robbing from the local populace and taking their land mainly. Here's another document from those alleged code enforcement people. Again, acting under the color of law. It looks all completely official, right? It's got your business card stating code enforcement officer. It's got reported a case date, case number, uh, all this garbage and their threat of condemning the property, right? Reported, found, it's, they're threatening condemnation so that they can take it by force. Now, here we go down and we look, IPMC, that's the International Property Maintenance Code, A106, Unlawful Acts. It shall be unlawful for a person, firm, or corporation to be in conflict with or in violation of any provisions of the code. So there you go. That is an overt declaration of international law, contrary to the Constitution and domestic sovereignty. These people are enemy agents and enemy combatants, too because they are in fact engaging in combat even though they have not yet gone to stepped over into the physical i mean they have stepped into physical in many locations and many places and at many times in this context they haven't stepped in the physical yet it's all on paper right well they have presented themselves and harassed and belligerated in person so in that sense you could and they of course carry arms and do other nonsense like that so yes you could say that they are have stepped into physical so here on this other page, we get the implications of what exactly they're doing. And it's along the same lines of the so-called immigration court. And they always have this strange obsession with 90 days. Don't know what that is. Fiance visas for 90 days. The removal orders allegedly according to the INA anyway for 90 days. And this one also stipulates 90 days. Very weird. They always have this obsession with 90 days. Violations, failure to obtain a rental dwelling permit with 90 days of January 1st and or within 90 days of change of ownership and or within 90 days of change of use shall result in a $1,000 per unit fine. In addition, any violation of the section shall be prosecuted pursuant to section 106 and 107 of the International Property Maintenance Code. Isn't that lovely? And of course they put compliance date in red. Ugh, these people are, I, I, I really cannot comprehend what the individuals enforcing this garbage are thinking. I cannot believe that they don't understand there are going to be bad consequences for them. They should not be involved in these schemes. The people hiding behind them will hang the people, the underlings, out to dry when they get the consequences for what they're being directed to do by the criminals that are hiding behind them. If you had, had enjoyed this video, please uh, like and share it and subscribe to my other channels. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.